A new romantic comedy crashes off the end of the runway without ever taking flight. Hi, I'm Richard Dunbeck, aka The Jaded Cinephile, and I'm here today to talk to you about Baggage Claim. If you saw my review of Gravity, you might remember that I mentioned Baggage Claim and that I'd probably wind up seeing it. And, well, there I was, here I am, here you are. To call this movie dreadful would probably be a kindness to it, because I think it's actually much worse than that. Paula Patton stars as Montana, a beautiful young flight attendant, with a mother obsessed with marriage, so much so that she's been married five times already. But Montana can't seem to find the right guy, which is especially stressful because her younger sister is getting ready to get married, and, well, you wouldn't want to be the oldest unwed daughter in the family, apparently. I guess that's just some kind of curse, at least the way this movie portrays it. So, in order to find herself a fiancé, Montana and her friends, including a busty, sex-obsessed, mentally deranged flight attendant named Gail, played by faded former singing star Jill Scott, put together a plan which is both ludicrous and illegal to track all of the flights that her ex-boyfriends go on so that she can conveniently be on the same flight with them by coincidence and run into them, talk to them, and potentially woo them into asking her for her hand in marriage all within 30 days of the wedding ceremony for her younger sister. If this sounds ridiculous, that's because it is. This whole film has this strange, frankly kind of childlike attitude about it. I mean, Montana herself is portrayed in such a bizarre, infantilized fashion. She has this crazy outlook that she can find the right guy to marry in 30 days, by going back to ex-boyfriends who she hated the first time around, but hoping that a couple years' distance will have made them into the perfect suitor, which seems impossible because she has crazy standards. I don't want a guy who works too much. I don't want a guy who's rude. I don't want a guy who does this or that. I mean, she has this whole spiel at the beginning of the film where, I mean, like, she disqualifies guys who are too nice, too quiet, too, too rude, too loud, too rich, too poor. Like, she doesn't know what she wants because she wants nothing. And then on top of that, she goes on this bizarre and illegal scheme to try and woo some guy in 30 days by hopping flights and clocking 30,000 miles of travel. And I'm not sure if that's at her own expense or if the airline really just comps that many flights to its employees. I mean, I hope so, because otherwise she's going to be in debt for years with all these flights that she's taking. First class, every single one of them, of course, because her ex-boyfriends are apparently all wealthy. One's a record mogul, one's a politician, one's some globe-trotting businessman. She says she met them all on flights, so I guess maybe that's... Possible, but it just seems ridiculous. And then there's also this whole thing throughout the movie where she has voiceover narration, and it's so childlike the way it's written and performed. You know, I mean, she'll explain things that we just saw or just heard someone say a second ago, and she says it like it's some kind of new revelation that surprises her so much. Like, her current boyfriend, this that's where the movie starts, she has a boyfriend, but uh, she goes to, she met him on a flight, of course, she flies to Chicago to spend Thanksgiving with him, he says he has to go to New York for a business trip, he puts her in a hotel, Gail calls on the phone and says, I bet he's cheating on you, uh, Montana doesn't believe it, but she goes to his house anyway, she sneaks around, she hides in a garbage can, to avoid being spotted. Think about that. I mean, she climbs into a garbage can to spy on this guy. She looks in his window, and at first he's there all alone, getting ready with his papers, like you know, he said he would be. And she's immediately like, Oh, he's all alone, just like I thought. And then she goes into a dream sequence, and it's like, but he's not totally alone, because I'm there with him. And so are our two children. 
and our best friends. And it's Christmas, so there's mistletoe. I mean, it's so bizarre. Like, what grown person thinks and talks like this? You just don't. She says that she's only been dating him a couple months after they met off flight, and obviously she can't be seeing him that much because he lives in Chicago, and she lives somewhere near, I guess, Washington, D.C. She says she's an hour away from Georgetown, so I guess... And you're thinking like this? Like, we're getting ready to get married and have children? What kind of person are you? You're, you're acting like a teenage girl. And, I, 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 I mean, just, it's flabbergasting. And then, of course, uh, another woman walks into the house. She's pregnant, and her boyfriend's getting all cuddly with them. So she, of course, breaks up with him and is like, okay, this is over. So now her sister announces her wedding, and oh, I can't go to the wedding rehearsal by myself and be the old spinster sister. Never on my she's only like 28, but apparently that's an old spinster because of her mother's impossible standards for getting her children married off. So Gail and their mutual sassy gay friend set up this plan, like, okay, we're going to take all your contacts off your cell phone, and anytime a man you have ever known goes on a flight through our airline, we're going to track it, because we're going to get all the other airline people involved in this, the ticket counter lady, the security guard guy, the, the baggage bellhop dude at the curbside, they're all going to be in on it, so if any one of your ex-boyfriends goes on a flight, we're going to tell you, and you can jump on there and just coincidentally be seated next to him, although I don't know how you're going to get a the exact seat that you need, the last minute notice on a first class flight, but they do it. And the funny thing is, is that Jill Scott's character, Gail, is portrayed as being insane in the movie. I mean, she's completely off the wall bonkers. You know, she's the one who tells Montana to hide in the trash can, to go to the boyfriend's house in the first place. She believes that you should just get married for love and money, and all the other characters are telling her that she's completely, completely insane, but she's the only one who actually points out that this plan is illegal and they could go to prison for doing it. So how am I supposed to like these characters then? I mean, I guess I kind of like her because she's the one who actually is honest enough to say this is wrong. I mean, she still goes through with it, but she admits that it's wrong. But I'm supposed to like this Montana girl, who's the main character, and she seems fucking nuts. She has the mental acuity of a 12-year-old. She commits heinous crime just to find a guy to hope that he'll propose with less than a month of time together? Like, this woman needs to be committed, and so do her friends and her mother. I mean, this mother character, and I, forgive me, I forget the actress's name. She kind of looks like the mom from Sister Sister. Uh, Tia Mori is in the movie as well, so there's that connection. I'm not sure if it is the mom from Sister Sister, but it looked like her. But this woman has been married five times. Like, she just keeps getting married and married and married. That's how the movie opens. The movie just opens with, like, you know, the Fox logo, and then it just, poof, wedding chapel. My mom loves weddings, and especially hers, and hers, and hers, and hers. And it goes on and on, showing her getting married, like, five times in the course of, I don't know, 20, 25 years. You know, it's like, okay, that does happen to people, but she's, like, so, like... She's so obsessed with the idea of it, and it's just like, why? And at the end of the movie, just to confuse it even more, the mom has this heart, you know, heartwarming speech with Montana, where she's like, the only husband I ever loved was my first one, and that was your daddy. Oh, God. You know, oh, and she loved him because he knew how to make pancakes. That's the whole speech. It's like, every Sunday I would sleep in, but... He would go downstairs and make pancakes, and I could hear him because he would clang the pans together like that, but I always stayed in bed and let him come and think he was waking me up so he could serve me pancakes in bed. And every day I wake up hoping that I'll smell those pancakes. Pancakes! Did, did Eli Roth have something to do with writing this movie? It's just like some kind of weird cabin fever thing. I don't know. 
oh god, like I actually, I took notes when I got home and I, oh god. So basically, they have this whole thing where she runs into like, I don't even know how many ex-boyfriends. I mean, there's probably there's like four or five that actually get screen time. The Plus, there's a bunch of other ones that just go by in a montage, which all get rejected, of course. Including one guy who... If you just follow what happens on screen, he appears to be rejected by Montana because he doesn't know how to use chopsticks. That's all you see of this guy is him and Montana at a date uh, at a Chinese restaurant where they're eating sushi, or maybe that's Japanese, forgive me if I'm a, a cultural idiot here, but they're eating sushi with chopsticks. And the guy doesn't know how to use them, so he's doing this where he's holding one in each hand, trying to pick up his food, and she just looks at him disapprovingly, and then whoosh, wipe at it out of the screen and now to the next boyfriend. So apparently this woman is so childish that she actually rejected a potential suitor because he doesn't know how to use chopsticks. How is she supposed to find anybody to love? But, oh... Let's not forget that the movie has the obvious true love. Her neighbor across the hall, William, and his horrible bitch girlfriend, Taylor or Tucker or something like that. You know, who's like Ben Montana's best friend since they were children. You know, he proposed to her with a toy ring from a Cracker Jack box when they were in fourth grade. It's so patently obvious they're going to wind up together, but the movie draws it out. You know, like, every time something goes wrong, one of the ex-boyfriends turns out to still be a jerk. William's always there to pick things up and help Montana get herself back together. Every single time. It's so obvious. And then, of course, halfway through the movie, we find out that his girlfriend is cheating on him. She left town. She said her grandmother had fallen ill and she had to go be there. But, of course... One of the flights that Montana works on, the girlfriend comes on board with her lover. You know, it's just so obvious. It's just terrible. And, you know, so of course William winds up finding out. He dumps this woman. And finally the day of the sister's wedding rehearsal comes around. And leading up to it for like a week, uh, Montana told her mom that she had an announcement to make. So, of course, the mom thinks she finally got engaged. They get to the wedding rehearsal. Montana goes up in front of the whole wedding party to give a speech, you know, and as she's giving the speech, one of her suitors, this horrible politician guy who basically, she saw him, she went out with him uh, to some kind of fundraising dinner for his Senate campaign, and he told her that women should be quiet and do whatever their husbands say, and that she needs to shut up and stop thinking for herself. So, of course, she left him. But then he comes back at the end of the movie, comes into the wedding rehearsal, and proposes marriage in front of the whole group, which, of course, Montana's mom immediately says yes to, as if she's in the fucking Middle Ages selling off her daughter for a dowry or something. I don't fucking no. But Montana, Montana says no because she has respect for herself and her announcement is that she did meet someone. She met herself. Yeah, the movie goes there. And it's absolutely as cheesy and awful as it sounds. It's so bad. But yes, yeah, she says that she met herself. You know, she gives back a bunch of gifts from her other boyfriends and just like, I'm just going to be with myself. But then, of course, she goes home after the wedding party, finds a gift on the table. Uh, her friends want her to open it. She doesn't feel like it, but then they convince her. She opens it, and there's a Cracker Jack box inside with a big thing on the front that says, Toy Ring Inside. So you get that reference back to the fourth grade thing. And then the inside of the lid, there's a plane ticket to France taped in there. And there's this whole convoluted fucking conclusion where uh, William's at the airport getting ready to get on the plane hoping she'll be there you know she gets the ticket just like minutes before the plane is supposed to take off so all of her friends at the airport are trying to stall this guy and then she finally gets there the plane's taking off she's too late she thinks he's gone but oh then she turns around and there he is waiting for her and he proposes and she says yes the fucking end 
this movie's probably like 90 minutes long and it felt like 90 hours. It's so excruciatingly not funny. The acting's no good. I mean, they're energetic, but they're so just... It's so not in tune with what the acting should be for this movie. It's just broad and hammy. I mean, the, the gay friend is like the biggest stereotype. He's so verklempt about everything. I mean... The Cracker Jack box puts him on the verge of tears, and when she makes that speech about how she found herself, he literally does this. That's beautiful. Christ! And, and, and this movie was directed by David E. Talbert, who also wrote the book that this movie is based upon, and I cannot imagine the experience of reading that book if it is anything like this movie, and I'm sure it must be, because it's directed by the author. I mean, it would be like reading infantile scrawlings written on construction paper with Crayola crayons. It's just, this movie is, it's about people who are pushing 30 or past it, but they act like they're 12, and it's so... Oh my god, it was just... It was such a painful experience to sit there and just... Searching for something to laugh about and not being able to find it, except for the cinematography, which is so bafflingly terrible. Like, I don't normally notice these things when cinematography is just... bad, unless it's like, you know, found footage shaky cam bad, I'll notice that, but the way this movie is shot, the lighting is so flat, and the depth of field is so shallow that every location they go to, it looks like the characters are standing in front of a blue screen. And I honestly thought that they were, because this does feel like a very low-budget production that wouldn't be able to afford location photography, but then they walk into the background, and it's like, oh my god, that's a real place? What the like, I can't even explain, I don't even know how you pull this off, where you make a real location look like it's a blue screen matte backdrop. <sighs> you know, I, Jesus, like, I mean, the acting's not very good. I, the only act people I immediately recognize in this movie are... Jill Scott and Tia Mowry, who I can't believe they're still working, but maybe they're popular in some community. I don't know. They must be. Maybe it's the same community that made the best man holiday happen. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's the, everyone else in this movie I'm not familiar with immediately. I guess some of them are rappers or something. But this... Paula Patton woman who plays Montana, I mean, she's very pretty, but she doesn't have much of an acting range, and I also noticed just her voice was so strange. I mean, it's like this deep, husky, kind of harsh, gravelly voice, like if Kathleen Turner gargled with whiskey and smoked 20 packs of cigarettes every day. That's what Kathleen Turner already does, but you get what I mean. You know, it's just so weird, and it's like, honestly, she sounded like she needed to clear her throat and get a glass of water throughout the whole movie. I'm like, somebody help this poor woman. Maybe that's just how she sounds. But the acting is just very broad and very just... It's like a Laurel and Hardy, but it's not that kind of movie, you know what I mean? It's just... People struggling to be funny, and the only way they know how to be funny is to be completely silly, and it just doesn't work. It's, oh, you know, oh, you know, and I guess David Talbert has directed movies before. I don't think I've seen any of them, but he's not very good. I mean, the pacing's awful. Uh, it's just the sense of the directing is so bad. Like, there's a scene where Montana and William do a little dance. Oh, I didn't even bring this up. Yeah, so, after one of her boy ex-boyfriends treats her like shit, William picks Montana up and drives her home, and, you know, they go back to his place, like, 2 a.m. or something. He makes drinks, and they're watching movies and reminiscing about high school, and they have this whole thing where, oh, they play doctor. Like, he pulls out his old toy, like, Fisher-Price stethoscope to play doctor with her because they did that when they were children. Again, this movie is very childlike. But then they go into a dance number. 
where they're playing the song they danced to at their prom after William's girlfriend dumped him and he spent the rest of the night with Montana. And, you know, it's like they're dancing, they're obviously choreographed, but the whole thing is shot where it's mostly just close-ups of their faces, like like the angle you're seeing of me right now. So it's like you can, you can get the idea that they're probably dancing, but they could also just be shaking violently. It's just, you know, like the camera will cut back to a wide angle for a couple seconds here and there, so you can see that they are dancing, but it's just... My God. I, you know, I'm laughing now, so I guess that's good. I wasn't terribly entertained watching the movie itself. Like I said, this is less than, or more than dreadful. I mean, it's like on the scale, like, you know, dreadful's like way up here, and dreadful's like the bottom of the barrel, but it's way up here, and baggage claims down here, so it's somewhere in like this substrata below the barrel. It's getting very close to where Freddy Got Fingered is on the Roger Ebert scale of the barrel, if you know what I'm talking about. It's just... <sighs> in a week where gravity is in theaters and the critically acclaimed Rush, which I will be seeing soon. I actually got a free ticket with my points card when I bought a ticket to see this. So, there's one positive. I get to go see Rush for free. Nice. Uh, but, you know, when you can see Rush or Gravity or anything else, I mean, if you have an independent theater near you, it's probably showing Parkland, the new film starring Paul Giamatti that's all about the JFK assassination. That looks excellent. I haven't seen it yet, but it looks great. Why would you go see Baggage Claim? Why would anybody see it? I mean, even among the string of terrible all-black movies that have come out this year, and I granted there haven't been that many because, unfortunately, all-black movies just are not that popular, but, you know, we had Tyler Perry's Meet the Peoples, which is genuinely the most unpleasant film I've seen all year. It's just nasty. And then there was Tyler Perry's Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor, which is bordering on my top ten of the year list. Not because it's good, but because it is so insanely, unbelievably terrible that it's absolutely hilarious. You know, and then we come to this crap, and we don't have much else to look forward to except for Medea's Christmas, which it, I... Yeah, I'm going to see it, but I really wish I wasn't. And then The Best Man Holiday, which I want to talk about this, because I've seen that trailer a few times. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but was The Best Man really that big of a hit movie that it warranted a sequel? I mean, I barely remember that that movie existed. Was it some kind of cultural touchstone for a group that I'm just not paying attention to? I don't know. Like, that movie seemed like it came and it went and it wasn't that big of a hit. Maybe it was huge on home video or something. I don't know. But all of a sudden, we've got this fucking sequel, The Best Man Holiday, coming out of nowhere, which has the most inept trailer possible for a film like this. I mean, it's just like, the friends you all love. And it's like, these are people I barely remember even existed in that other movie that I barely remember watching. <sighs> You know, I mean, Terrence Howard, I don't understand. He goes from being in excellent movies to being in possibly direct-to-video crap that still winds up in the theater. You know what? Maybe The Best Man Holiday is going to be great. Maybe I'm just being unfair and judging it from the trailer, but the trailer looks absolutely terrible, and that's what's supposed to make me want to see the movie. But, you know, I mean, Terrence Howard is in films like Prisoners, or the severely underrated Red Tails, and then he shows up in crap like this. Oh my god. Or, or another one, About Last Night. I mean, I, I guess that's like a semi-remake of the old Rob Lowe movie, but with Kevin Hart and the guy from CSI. That doesn't look good either. And the, fun, the thing is, I get, why are we getting trailers for it now? Like, I've been seeing trailers for that movie all year long, since about 
February, and the trailer says that movie's not coming out until Valentine's Day of 2014. I haven't seen a trailer play for this long since the trailer for Battle of the Year 3D. That played for a year before that movie came out. And it doesn't even look funny either. I mean, I guess if you like Kevin Hart, you would find it funny. I don't get the appeal. I don't find him funny at all. But I got two trailers with him. I got the About Last Night trailer and I got the trailer for Grudge Match, I think it's called. With De Niro and Stallone playing old boxers who come back for one more fight. Jesus, fuck. This whole experience at the cinema was just no fun. This terrible movie and all these terrible trailers. I think the only good trailer that I saw before this movie was 12 Years a Slave. And I'm not sure why that trailer was playing in front of Baggage Claim. Except that some old, out-of-touch, white-bread film executive at 20th Century Fox said, This movie's about black people too, so we should put it in front of the black comedy movie. Oh, that movie looks great. I'm not seeing anything bad about that. 12 Years a Slave, I hear, is excellent. I'm really excited to see it, but that was the only good part of my experience at the movies today with this crap. I'll say it again. Just go watch Gravity. Please.